Hello and welcome to The Last Standee, a board game podcast coming to you from a trio of thrilling countries across Europe. I'm joined here today by Alessio. Hello. And Alexis. From Belgium. Bonjour. And returning as your host is me, Fen, that's me, and my dog who's staring at me, that's Pam. Today we're going to be talking about Mindbug, Hadrian's Wall, and Souk slash Spice Merchant. But first of all, it's time for the last dandy catch-up. So what's been up with you, Alessio? Well, uh, it has been a bit of gaming, a bit here and there. I am playing War Chest uh, kind of a lot. I I received a few Kickstarters. I think I already talked about receiving Everdell, the complete collection pledge. And wow, it's huge. It's bigger than Gloomhaven. <laughs> so yeah, uh, I I haven't received mine, so I can only assume the fact that I asked for the upgraded components has delayed the whole thing. Oh yeah, uh, and uh, yeah, it's probably completely delayed because the forums uh, on BGG have the have the same comments uh, these days. So it's it must be it, and uh, I have to I have to say that uh, there are a lot. Of stickers in that uh, in that box. <laughs> I I think uh, uh, the the kids enjoyed those. There are a bit of spare stickers, so we have axolotl stickers everywhere in the house now. And uh, that uh, that being said, of course, a lot of Kickstarter are, uh, are actually delivering these days. A lot of old stuck at Kickstarter, for instance, uh, the aforementioned John Company. And I'm really curious to play this one. And I also got the physical edition of Concordia Salsa, which uh, is very interesting. I hope to play it physically very soon. So that's basically it. Uh, what about you, Alexis? Um, I've not been able to play too many board games recently. I've been moving around a lot. But thankfully, uh, hopefully, I should be able to have more time at home uh, for the next few weeks. Uh, one thing that I received very recently was um, uh, Demon Bone Sarcophagus, which is, um, I think I mentioned last time that it was going to come soon. Um, it is a, an old school dungeon. Um, ah, yeah, I remember like that. An, yeah, for an OSR type game. Uh, I've since then read it. Uh, it's been written by um, Patrick Stewart, uh, not that one. Um, yeah, sir. And it is, <laughs> <laughs> uh, and it is a wonderful, um, quirky little dungeon adventure in which the players find themselves uh, by mistake in between four different factions that are uh, conspirating and chasing each other in one dungeon. Uh, it has a little bit of a, a brother coiny um, type. Uh, atmosphere in the, the way that the factions interact uh, because the players are basically like finding themselves in, in between multiple people that don't really have any specific relationship with, uh, with uh, each other but due to fate uh, find themselves at the exact same spot at the exact wrong time. Um, it's been pretty fun. Um, I've also played a couple of uh, tiny board games here and there with uh, friends and family but uh, we'll talk about that in a little bit. Uh, what about you, Fen? Well, uh, as I'm sure people have noticed, I've been absent from the past two recordings. Uh, we were babysitting a beagle puppy, and um, it turned out she did not get on very well with Pam, which, you know, it's always a concern with dogs, so uh, we had to endure, and it's been a lot of chaos and mayhem, and essentially dividing the house into two parts, and trying to ensure neither dog got really jealous, because... Dogs just really like me for the most part. Um, and uh, so both dogs start getting jealous over me. And um, eventually it, it got pretty, uh, pretty desperate. But fortunately, she's now back with her owner. She's a delight. We we're definitely going to have beagles from that breeder further down the line. But Pam is a one dog, one, ha one dog in a house dog. So a, a single dog. Uh, yeah, um, I had John Company arrive, uh, which I um, and I back and forth on whether I was going to get. But once I properly looked into 
that what was happening with it, I was like, at least it is historically interesting. I still haven't played it. To be honest, I don't know when I'll play it, but uh, it's a nicely put together production at least. Um, and I am currently waiting for Everdale Complete Collection, as I just mentioned. It might turn up, it might not, I don't know. There's apparently still lots and lots of deliveries to go out across Europe, so often I find them at the back of the list now, and that might be because Sweden is an S, so alphabetically it's quite late on. Uh, I also have Verdant and Cascadia coming. They're arriving the start of next week. And Agents of Smirsch, which is from Everything Epic, who did the Big Trouble in Little China board game that I love. And, and this is Schmerz is, um It's a 1940s uh, USSR counterintelligence agency. Um, so this is like a pastiche on that moving forward to the 1970s as if like um there's an independent schmirsch so it's not associated with the ussr anymore it's gone rogue and you play un spy agents so it's kind of a james bond cooperative sort of board game um that feels a, a bit timely now um but uh, yeah, it should be quite interesting. I mean, as I said, like Big Trouble in Little China, because it was a licensed board game, is super hard to get. But it is, if you wanted Big Trouble in Little China, the board game, that's exactly what you get. And it is immense fun as a consequence, although it's not something you would play over and over and over again. It's good to chuck it out occasionally, have a bit of a bash and have a fun adventure um, with a, a bunch of different characters. So... Um, anyway, yeah, Agents of Schmirsch, probably by the next recording, I'll be able to at least talk a little bit about what it's been like. And then just recently, I have finally gotten around to playing Arkham Horrors The Forgotten Age. And I think that that's a um, that's a temple adventure, jungle adventure, snake themed because Yig is the it's, it's based on the I think it's called the Curse of Yig. Um, but Yig is like the father of serpents, so it's lots and lots of snakes, and it's quite different to many of the others. It's been interesting because combat is garbage. You get punished for killing things. Not everything, but like there's Yig doesn't like you killing snakes. You kill snakes, and Yig like really gets angry about that. And there's this whole vengeance mechanic where certain enemies or certain things become more dangerous if there's vengeance in the victory um, area. So I've been playing with Rita and Ursula. Ursula's from Forgotten Age and she's like a archaeologist and she's having a great time because she's very movement based. She's good at running away from things. And then Rita is a student track star from Arkham University who she deals with all the problems and Ursula's problems by running away from them. And so it's great. It's like Ursula wanders in and goes, oh my God, there's a load of snakes here. Help, I'm in trouble. And Rita goes, don't worry, I will save you by running away from them. Exactly. It, it, but <laughs> it's been a delight. The story has just had a big twist. Um, and I, I'm going to probably write about it when the full deluxe edition comes out, probably next year. Um but I can see why initially people didn't like Forgotten Age too much, but then played it more and got into it. Because it's actually, once you realise it's asking different questions of your investigators to normal, um, and you can't just get Mark Harrigan and blast your way through everything, uh, it's it's really interesting um, and kind of fun. Uh, I mean, like... Through a load of jungles, off to Arkham, back through a load of jungles. And now, as I said, we've just had the big twist coming into episode six. So uh, I'm not going to talk in any more details about it, but I can say it's like, I think it might be my second favourite after Carcosa. And it's way less punishing than Carcosa. Carcosa is, Carcosa right from the first episode, like kicks your ass with its stupid big bagpipe baby. <laughs> so, yeah. That's that's what I've been up to, and now I've been stared at by my dog, yeah, who is it. dressed up as a pool lion because she has she's been licking her paws and she has to wear a uh, inflatable donut round her neck and she hates it. <laughs> yeah, she's 
Uh, anyway, I am consoled by this thing about Carcosa because that's my next campaign I'll play <laughs> with it's, Camorror. So It's really good, but be aware the first and fourth stories episodes are super like they are way harder than at the others the first one in particular like I, I, one thing i will i will say is really consider putting fine clothes in your deck for the first couple of things <laughs> if you're not playing somebody who's just good at dealing with people without oh. beating them up okay <laughs> yeah yeah that... fine cl- it, that campaign was designed with fine clothes in mind at the start Okay. And it thematically makes sense. You start off at a theatre, so. Yeah, that's the, the, the theatre play, the first uh, episode. Yeah, yeah, yeah. The King in Yellow. Okay. Yeah. Yep. yeah, but it's very good, and uh, I'd love to hear your thoughts about it down the line. So, speaking of thoughts and everything, um, it's, it's your topic first, which is a game I've not heard of before, but the tagline is Serve the Mind Bugs, Summon Hybrids, and Mind Control Your Opponent's Best Cards. Oh, that does sound like a good title. Uh, I wanted to have a quick uh, word about the news. Well, oh, not just okay. not the uh, yeah. news, news just in general. Okay, okay, all right. Yeah, yeah we, Well, uh, Alexis is just taking control of the the podcast. Then there you go. <laughs> well, I've I've used my uh, mind book cards. I I've not played the game, so I'm not sure that works. But I I taking I'm I'm taking over. Um, I just wanted to to point out, I usually don't talk too much about KDM, especially as it's uh, been in limbo for so long right now. But for, recently... For people, KDM is Kingdom Death, colon, bleh, monster. <laughs> um, yeah, it's it's been, it's supposed to uh, have stuff delivered for four years now. We've been waiting on the uh, the basically goodies box that was supposed to arrive before the new expansion for four years and the new expansion uh, are nowhere to be seen and probably won't be around for another two, three years. I don't know. It doesn't really matter right now. Um, I just wanted to to like point out that recently uh, Adam has been pu- uh, pushing an update telling us that he's basically like delaying any update for another month-ish before telling us anything uh, and skipping the next update, basically, which um, great Adam, it's been years, we we keep waiting and every time that he tries to slowly uh, show a token of goodwill to show the community that he's still interested and wants to make things right, uh, he still managed to completely uh, piss all over the Kickstarter and fuck everybody up and still think that he, he deserved to have hype for his game. Um, I'm getting really tired of this this thing. Um, David from the, um, the podcast has already sold his pledge and uh, I, I'm i pretty sure that after the GC falls, I'm going to follow him uh, on that. Anyway, that was just like a tiny bit of news that I wanted to point out because this is really disappointing and I think that it's out of the... Um, it, it's even beyond what Adam usually um, gives us. Yeah, yeah. yeah. T- t- tiresome is probably the best definition of what's happening. It's um, it's really sad because this is the flagship game of the boss battle in genre and had a moderately successful first Kickstarter that generated a lot of hype and kind of did help build into board games being so big on Kickstarter, then had a really big, exciting second Kickstarter launch and now has drifted so far off um, and kind of done nothing but release a few cards here and there and some pinups. And it's just, well, Vagrant Songs come along. It was amazing. Town Folks Tussles come along. It's amazing. And both of those are like, you can play them in an evening with people who are not interested in Theme of Kingdom Death. Oathsworn. We talked about that for a whole episode. I mean, a second Kickstarter's on right now. Oathsworn doesn't even fall into that 90s trap of thinking doing random punishments to players is good. Oathsworn is like a modern design of a boss battler. And, you know, like, seriously, yeah. it's, it's we fantastic. We have uh, Aeon Trespass Odyssey that's going to come out soon, yeah, too. Yeah, that's about to and, land um, soon. Yeah. Yep, San Kakushin, as we've... We've had Sa- them on the episode Access Monday. Sand Gurkushin yeah. is going to be amazing. Yep. Um, like all of those games are just going to leave Kingdom Death in the dust. And mm. 
And I really don't understand how Adam can keep pushing things uh, back and announcing that he'll be done like next month. He announced uh, that he will be done next month a year ago. Uh, and it, it took him a year to be, I don't know, but I have no idea when the, Kickstar when the, the GC will be done. And the expansion definitely won't be done for another few years. So I, I can't really see Kingdom Death still being around for, for too long at this point uh, it's yeah. hard to say it really it, is it, it, it's not even a matter of uh, being left in the dust because um, there's nothing to gain in having uh, uh, a otherwise great game under many aspects uh, just dragged down by this mismanagement it's just that people just want play so yeah <laughs> yeah it, yeah exactly people want like people who are g still getting into the game are like i really want to play with the the expansions you know uh, and you do i'll be honest i don't think kingdom death with just three quarry monsters is a very engaging game you can argue all you like that oh that's uh three different levels of each different monster but the variations from one level to the next are not so much a whole new monster they're just a reiteration and a difficulty cranks, which is why the expansions become so important because, you, you know, maybe a second, third playthrough, it's time to inject something new into this early part of the game. You can't get them. They, they had a reprint. They flew off the shelves. People desperately ask where they are. And then for those of us who've been playing longer, we're like, can we have actually have something substantially new, please? Um, yeah, the, the content has been yeah. stale for so long. And, and on top of that, uh, specifically, it also aged quite a bit because, uh, as you mentioned, like a few games came out of the, the boss battler um, genre mm -hmm. since then. And they've been they've been taking what Kingdom Death has done and doing better with yeah. it, doing like bringing new concepts in yeah. it and, yeah. and doing some more interesting stuff. Townsfolk has that... stripped it down. Um, really well and made it more accessible on the theming. Oathsworn stays within that grim kind of fantasy, but again, it's a more acceptable, uh, enticing form of grim fantasy, closer to Warhammer style of, you know, not kind of grim, but not not super like, uh. um, it ATO is going to expand a lot on everything that isn't... Um... Uh, combat the, the combat system yeah. and the combat system itself is already going to to get like a lot of new things in ATO. Mm -hmm. The Senko Kuchin is doing so many interesting stuff with yep. the way that it, it handles combat. Um, Kingdom Death just feels stale right now and as much as I love the game and I, I just um, uh, shipped the game to my boyfriend basically so that to be able to play a, a campaign at some point soon but I it's been I have not opened it in maybe a year and a half, maybe two years. Um, I, I I think that a game like this needs to have some content being released at least every couple of years, just to if it wants to stay around. I um, would say that they could have had a release schedule of one to two expansions a year, um, and that they could have just kept going and going with that and done as long as they distributed it and printed it in reasonable numbers it would just be fine and fantastic. My biggest problem and saddest thing of this whole situation is what it's done to the community because you've essentially split the community into three separate blocks and there's people who are pushing to get this content and they, they're tired and they just want their game and they want to play their game. And then there's people who are just, they're either like, oh, well, I'll just wait whenever it turns up or they're so worn down that they become completely ambivalent and they're just silent. They just stop talking in the Kickstarter on Board Game Geek forum. You've seen the traffic drop on Board Game Geek. It's down, way down. I, on yeah, the I mean, yeah. also, also in six years, there's people that just aren't around anymore. Mm -hmm. for... Yeah, yeah. Nick, um, Nick Wirtz, aspiring cadaver, has basically moved on. Um, and yeah, I, I don't. I don't really know how much Twist is still doing on it. They're still playing every week, I think. But yeah, there's there's other content creators who've just stopped. There hasn't been much in the way of new content creators. Uh, Mithra Bra has come in, and that's about it on the relevant new content creators. But I also want to say like that these two sections of the audience, you know, the ones who are like, come on, get this out, and the ones who are completely ambivalent, there's this third section who were just white knighting like crazy and 
it has just created a really toxic environment for the community where it's turned in on itself and it's now not just hurling at at Adam, it's hurling at each other and it's uh, this is meant to be a board game. There should be joy in this. There should be fun in this. There should be excitement, surprises. You should be going, oh my goodness, the game can do this. And instead we're like drumming our fingers while we throw things at each other on the sidelines. Yeah, that's just sad. It is. It's, it, it, I've, I've really, I've said it every year. I hope that the gamblers just hurry up and comes out next year. But I don't know what happens if it's not like... 2023 shipping in second quarter at the latest yeah that seems to be what we we can expect yeah yeah they really like that ideally they should get this all done before the chinese new year (laughs) that's not happening it's not happening no no it could easily be done but no there's a firm foot on the neck of the game and it's uh, gasping for breath at the moment so, yeah. Um, anyway, should we should we go on to Mind Bug and talk about yes. something yeah, yeah, positive yeah. and fun? It's going unless you take us on a yeah, journey yeah, um, I, with minds I, and bugs. Exactly. I'll use my own Mind Bug now. So uh, Mind Bug, uh, Mind Bug is a very quick card game that, done uh, by NetLab Studios, which is uh, st- uh, basically a studio name for uh, a host of. Uh, I think they are famous uh, Magic the Gathering playtesters, but uh, uh, I actually don't recognize all the names because I left uh, Magic oh so many years ago. So I'll just uh, drop the name like uh, Scafelias, uh, Marvin Hagen, uh, Christian Kudel, and uh, of course it's co-designed by uh, Richard Garfield, which who for the for the car gaming community is the man, basically. So, uh, Mindbug, what's Mindbug? Uh, basically, it's a game when you get when you and one opponent get 10 cards each. You draw from these 10 cards uh, a hand of five cards. They are only creatures. You have only creatures and every creature is super powerful. You, uh, your goal is just to uh, have the total uh, health points of your opponent drop to zero. They start at three and every attack you make with a creature uh, drops it by one plus uh, all the rules uh, and uh, the regular car play which remembers a lot of uh, uh, the, creat- the creature fight in uh, actual Magic the Gathering. Uh, what's the twist in this game? Uh, you have two mind bugs. You and your opponent have two mind bugs, which are two special cards, w- which are, are always uh, in play, basically. And uh, when your opponent plays a card, you can just decide, uh, nope, that's mine. Uh, you uh, pull, uh, you, you use up a mind bug card, and you take that creature. That's it. Uh, if you do that, the opponent gets uh, another turn immediately, and uh, you go on until someone is basically at zero hit points. <laughs> e- the game is very simple. Basically, uh, the turns are either you you play a creature, you have no casting cost for the creature, so you just play it, and the opponent must just decide if they want to use their mind back there or not. And uh, this this is a turn. Otherwise, you can just attack with one of your creatures. So uh, that's basically it. Uh, players alternate taking turns and eventually someone drops to zero. <laughs> now, uh, this game has, uh, is very simple and uh, as it happens with games this simple, uh, it has a lot of depth. Uh, why? Be- first, because uh, the, the, the creatures are actually very, very interesting. Uh, they are funny creatures. They are basically hi- hybrids. In this game, you are mad scientists uh, who create hybrids to 
with creatures you have for for instance uh, the, the the most beautiful card i ever saw is the is the hamster lion uh, i love it it's a, a big lion with the face of a hamster it's beautiful um, sorry sorry nothing compares to the giraffe dial yeah the giraffe dial is one of the funniest <laughs> uh, i have the italian version so the, the 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 name of the cards are, are even more evocative for me but I think there's a slugapult, which is a slug and a catapult, which is beautiful. Which is a beautiful concept. That <laughs> that is very nearly a reference to a like um, EDH deck, whether it's on purpose or not. But there's Toxwell the corrosive <laughs> who generate. Who is a big slug who makes more slugs, and then there's a whole system of throwing said slugs at people. But uh, yeah. Yeah, and anyway, the, the, the creatures are beautiful and interesting. And of course, since you have no casting cost and the creatures are the focus of the game, every creature is super powerful. There's no weak draw in this game. You have a combination... Ah, uh, a thing I, a, a, a thing I think I didn't say is that you draw for... You all draw for, from the same deck. So you basically have a deck of cards and that's it. You get okay. De- you get ten cards. Oh, we, we that's ch- interesting. Yeah. Mm. Uh, uh, so that's going to bring my question once you've onto questions quite relevant. But carry yeah. On. Okay. Uh, so basically, you you have uh, a deck of cards. You take each ten cards from this deck. So basically, the the card the, the card you have uh, won't be in your opponent's deck, and uh, you will play from there. So you have to adapt to what's uh, your draft, of which you know only half, because you get you start with five cards in hand, the other five you don't know what they are, and uh, you have to play and decide. It's a, a bit of a bluffing game because you have to 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 not uh, drop your the card you 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 don't have to play immediately the card you plan to use to damage your opponent because that will be mind bugged uh, you can play alternate uh, routes to victory because for instance there are cards which damage if they attack even if they are unblocked ah, of course uh, i said that this is uh, like uh, Magic the Gathering. It means that you have to attack with a creature. If you if your attack is successful, the opponent basically loses one HP. But uh, uh, you can block uh, with uh, the opponent can decide to block with one of their creature. So basically, if they block, the creatures uh, kill uh, each other depending on their level of power and their abilities. For instance, if a card is uh, Venomous, uh, you can... uh, I don't know if it's Poisonous or Venomous, the name of the ability, of course. I think it's Venomous because uh, Poison is when you hit it, right? So, uh, uh, basically, the the cards have ability and the the creatures uh, you use may have additional abilities. For instance, there are cards that then when you attack they immediately damage the opponent and then they uh, carry on with their attack so it's a lot of this <laughs> uh, i think uh, it's a good time for questions after that <laughs> right so first of all i think it You'd be talking about Venom, uh, because Poisonous is on the Death Weaver, and that says opponents cannot activate play effects. Okay. Uh, Secondly, this is another one of these um, unique, lots of different cards, single deck drawn by both players. So how have you played Radlands, and how does it compare to that? Because Radlands is amazing. Uh, I haven't actually played the Redlands. I watched Redlands. I I think that this game doesn't compare a lot to Redlands, but compares to games like uh, uh, Battle Line, Rift Forts. Uh, these kind of games are more up this alley, most mostly because they are uh, filler sides and. And I, I'd say that an expert player can play it in 15 minutes, uh, start to finish. Uh, and that, that, that's Radlands. Small oh, deck, okay. single, oh. two players, done in about 15 minutes. So you may be thinking of a different game. Okay, yeah, pro- probably. Oh, okay, I was thinking of the Chip Theory game then. No, 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 <laughs> okay. no, 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 no. Ra- Radlands <laughs> is, is, is essentially a deck of cards and two sides on three lanes attack their 
post-apocalyptic people at each other trying to destroy each other's bases and it's got lots of like just lots of abilities and things that sounded similar and kind of the way everything's unique but uh I'm also seeing now that Mindbug reminds me a little bit of Epic, but probably more balanced because Epic is a terribly unbalanced card game. No, the, 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 yeah, the, the, there is a bit of risk of unbalance in some cases, uh, given mostly by the fact that you don't know the entirety of, the, of your deck when you start to play. So... Uh, there is a card, for instance, which is uh, the Axolotl Leader. Oh, oh uh, one thing I have to say is that uh, you have one or two cards multiplicity in the decks, so it's not given that uh, a certain card is not uh, appearing twice in your deck or is appearing also in your opponent's deck. For instance, there are two Axolotl Healers, we, which are cards that when they are played, you gain two health. So uh, they are very important to strategies and they change completely the way you approach a game if you uh, have them. Mostly because uh, uh, this is a card your opponent will uh, most assuredly want to, to take with a mind bug, but if they have it, uh, it is a very cra crappy attacking card or defending card. So it's basically uh, one wasted slot. So uh, it's important. Uh, it's all in this decision. So uh, the game is uh, is very dynamic. I, I like it, and it's uh, a mind trick game of bluffing and stuff. Probably it's. Uh, uh, the way you said it, uh, it's probably uh, reminiscing of uh, Redlands, but uh, the way it plays, it's probably very peculiar because it's uh, the play style is given both by your strategy and the bluffing game. So uh, it, it is not unusual that you see uh, players stacking creatures, which is usually uh, a thing that when you become expert uh, uh, stop doing because you prefer to finish early uh, and you see players stacking creatures and then when their deck is exhausted which is uh, five uh, cards to be drawn so it's uh, pretty fast and when everything is on play they just begin the massacre the slaughter and uh, eventually someone ends up with uh, uh, with zero hit points uh, and loses. Uh, yeah, that... yeah, it's this. It's very clearly just like Radlands, which is also from a former Magic the Gathering developer and designer. It's showing its Magic the Gathering right on its sleeve. Yeah, only they've chosen here to create a game that's lighter, and they've gotten rid of Magic's best and worst element, which is lands, because lands are terrible. Yeah, that <laughs> um, they, they are. They, they're one of the biggest sources of having a non-game is the land system in Magic, and I can see that they've excised this the same way that, well, they did it in Radlands in a different way. But yeah, so these are this is obviously a descendant of Magic the Gathering um, with a yeah. lighter, lighter play and a sillier theme. Yeah, I, I think that the meta in Magic the Gathering uh, evolves continuously, but uh, uh, I remember in the early 2000s uh, there was a way of playing white and blue or white and blue and black with control creatures and it reminds a lot of that kind of mind game you used to play when you played with those decks one against another. So uh, mind bug is very fun, I, I have to say this. Uh, basically, you, you will play two, three, four games, one after the other. It's uh, beautiful because when you can pull out that bluff uh, and you end up playing the card you wanted and possibly leave uh, the opponent with a card which is equally des desirable but it's completely powerless about uh, against what you are trying to play, uh, it's beautiful, it's very satisfying to play and uh, it's very fast to consume and appreciate. Uh, probably you will be distracted by the, the graphics and the funny creatures, uh, which are characteristics, which are characteristic and very beautiful uh, and uh, a very attraction of the, of the game. And uh, that's basically it. 
it's of it's obviously a, a filler game so you don't expect to play it 60 times in a row they uh, uh netherlab studios uh, went to Essen with some promos and uh, with a sneak peek of they what they expect to expand the game with. Uh, the game comes with uh, First Contact, which is the base set, plus an expansion. And you basically have this tiny deck of cards, which is everything you need. You, you can fit in your pocket, go away and play a lot of these games you can put it back forget about it for a while then you want to play again play four five six games in a row and you go on and it's always and it it feels fresh very consistently so uh, that's a very uh, nice game you can have for less than 30 dollars which uh, that's it the game and expansions so I think it's a very nice recommendation for me because I had a good time with it and that's all it matters actually. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, that is the best quality in a board game. Yeah, I would say then definitely target audiences, people who've enjoyed playing Magic in the past and want a more compact, uh, like non-sprawling thing. Um, yeah. I will very briefly as i talked about before i'll recommend radlands i'm not going to talk about it here but radlands <laughs> if you like if you like mindberg radlands is absolutely in the same wheelhouse and i'm also i will talk about it in the future one day but i'm just going to mention ashes rise of the phoenix born is one of my favorite dueling card games of all time um but i think it's time we moved on and um, yep Yep. So I was going to talk about Twilight Inscription and Hadrian's Wall, but uh, like there's <laughs> there's been a, an accident at the house and that needs to be dealt with. So time's a little more compressed. I am going to very briefly just say uh, Twilight Inscription is really good. It's a roll and write from Fantasy Flight Games. Um, it's gorgeous. It is well produced. The box is an appropriate size. Which is mind blowing, yeah. I haven't thrown the insert <laughs> out. It's incredible. It is a roll and write with dry erase boards, and they have asymmetry both on the boards. There's one side are all the same for each player. The other side, you can mix them all up. And these four boards, you can split around between, uh, you know, randomly to have different combinations each time. You can play with the alien races. It doesn't feel like Twilight Imperium roll and write to me. Um, and it does have the issue that the you don't know exactly when the end of the game's coming, and it's not in player's hands. It's either going to end on a given card in stage four, or it's going to end on the very last card in stage four. So sometimes it feels a little anticlimactic. It's a real brain burner. It's very clear iconography. It's like playing Space Bingo um, with four different mini games. Um, and it's if you play it one and two player, you have to play with an automata. That's it's very well handled. It's not particularly heavy work to deal with. Uh, the game's very cheap as well, so I can give a recommendation to Twilight Inscription if that sounds like the kind of thing you're interested in. You want a one and a half to two hour long roll and write, um, <laughs> and you don't want to play Roman roll. You want the space theme. Twilight Inscription, fantastic, and I, I can see myself playing it again. Uh, in the future m uh, many times but it does exhaust me playing it oh so so yeah. it's like twilight imperium <laughs> no it's not it's really not like apart it from the same... no but i when i finish a game of twilight imperium i'm not exhausted i'm like thrilled okay. and excited this uh i it's just you're thinking so much because you have to decide okay which I'm just putting the box down there. Which board am I going to activate this turn? Then what am I going to do on that given board? And sometimes you need prerequisites from a previous board to let you to do stuff on a different board. Even playing to the Joel Nar, who give you a benefit for activating all the boards in a fixed order, which is like as easy as you can get with the game telling you, do this, do this, do this, do this, and go round in a circle. It was still so much to think about. Um, so, so I've seen the game a couple of times. It is... It has a clear iconography, yeah. but it also has a uh, hundred thousand icons everywhere. It is really busy. Um, I will say the one board I love is the production board, which has a it's a hexagonal grid, but all the hexagons are circles, but they can easily be hexagons. <laughs> um, and you, yeah, and you have a resource, 
uh, in each of the circles, and you've got two choices. You can scrap it, which is crossing it out, or you can claim it. But the cool thing is you can't claim a, a resource unless you've scrapped a resource adjacent to it. So you're weaving your way through this grid of like, get rid of that, get rid of that. I'll have this one and this one and this one. Um, and you, it's that's pretty cool. Um, definitely my favorite of all of the four boards um, by a long hmm. way. So interesting mechanic. So b before we move on, just mm -hmm. one quick question. Uh, Twilight the Imperium is known to be a game that lasts uh, two to three to four to five hours. Uh, uh, four encryption to eight is hours. a lot. Ma ma make it <laughs> six. <laughs> uh, encryption is a lot faster, right? I did. Yes, I said. I, I said you may have missed it. It's a, they say ninety minutes to one hundred twenty minutes. Oh, right. uh, with less players, it's going to run faster. There's a lot of simultaneous turns going on, so as you know, as many rolling rights do, that should keep the timing down. But you've got a warfare step.